Good evening, everyone. My name is Talissa and I'm the project officer here at the Australian Ethical Health Alliance. Before the symposium commences, I'm going to spend a few moments running you through how you can participate in this webinar as an attendee. The first thing you will notice is that you do not have access to your microphone or camera. This is a deliberate feature of a Zoom webinar. Myself as the host can allocate speaking abilities to attendees should any of the panelists wish for this to occur. As the agenda for tonight's webinar is quite tight, we may not be able to give attendees the opportunity to speak. You are therefore encouraged to type your questions on the Q&A board, which you can access on the bottom of your screen as is demonstrated in our PowerPoint on screen at the moment. It is the double chat icon located on the right of the bottom bar. All submitted questions will be seen by panelists and answered questions will be displayed for all attendees. All questions will be submitted under your name. Many of the questions will be answered through, through to, throughout tonight's webinar and the agenda has allocated some time for questions and answers at the end of the session. The panelists will endeavor to answer your questions so please submit them using this feature. Please note that we will be recording tonight's webinar. Therefore, should you ask a question, your name may be mentioned during the webinar. The final feature I'll point you to is that you also have the ability to chat to other attendees and panelists on the webinar in a more informal way. This can be done through the speech bubble icon on the left. You'll see that as an attendee, you are allowed just two options within the chat to chat with all panelists and attendees or to chat with all panelists only. While this is a great feature to engage with other panelists, please note that these chats are not private. If you have any questions you'd like to ask me directly, please feel free to chat to me through this function. I will be available for technical support throughout the length of this webinar. That's all from me. I'll pass you to our AHA Chair, Adrian Casenza, for this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Talissa, and good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to the Australian Ethical Health Alliance inaugural symposium webinar, Ethics in the Healthcare Sector and its Importance During Times of Crisis. We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their contribution connection to land, waters and culture, we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to introduce you to the AEHA Steering Committee. These are your leaders representing uh, all uh, parts of the Australian healthcare sector, a dedicated, professional uh, and committed group, all who have the shared objective of improving uh, outcomes for healthcare, patient outcomes in the most ethical way. I'd also like to uh, introduce uh, Sophie Hibbard, uh, who is also a member of the steering committee, Medicines Australia Director, Ethics and Compliance. And Sophie and I will be sharing in this short uh, initial uh, presentation. The uh, Australian delegation officially presented the Australian Consensus Framework for ethical collaboration in the health sector at the APEC Business Ethics for SME Forum in Tokyo on the 20th of July, 2018. Um, Australia's presentation was launched by the Federal Minister of Health, the Honourable Greg Hunt. Um, and in the chat, Talissa will uh, place the access to the video. If you haven't seen the Minister's launch uh, speech, it is quite inspiring, timeless uh, and puts Australia uh, in a very, uh, very positive light. And uh, following that presentation, uh, Australia was actually awarded the APEC Ethics Lighthouse Award for leadership in ethics in the region. It's most pleasing to note uh, just this month, a landmark report uh, called The Ethical Advantage, commissioned by the Ethics Centre and produced by Deloitte's Access Economics, found that Australians believe healthcare sector is the most eth ethical sector uh, in Australia. It ranked uh, based on the methodology they used with an index score of 67, and it was followed by education, charities, and not-for-profit organisations, and then ag agriculture. There are some other sectors there who have a little bit of work to do. In June 20 this year, the Basel Institute on Governance 
uh, recognised the Australian Ethical Health Alliance as an exceptional model for unified commitment and coordination across the nation to align and strengthen ethical conduct. The report uh, that I mentioned earlier was quite a landmark report. Uh, many of you may have picked it up in the press. There's been a pitch put to uh, the federal government, the Australian people, for an investment of over four and a half billion dollars in ethical infrastructure. And the recommendations are quite wide ranging and they include tracking ethical performance over time, elevating the conversation about ethics across our society, teaching ethics, improving workplace culture and revamping the oversight of politics. Uh, recommenda these recommendations and others resonate strongly with AEHA ethos, principles and approach, and the Alliance endorses the report. The Australian consensus framework for ethical collaboration in the healthcare sector has three main aims. To promote collaboration and interaction, to encourage better dialogue, trust and respect, and to promote public confidence and trust. The body was formed in, two, in April 2019 as the leading body to guide the implementation uh, of the Australian Consensus Framework. And the Alliance seeks to facilitate ethical behaviour, provide general guidance, encourage and monitor the evaluation of activities related to principles outlined in the Consensus Framework. From a standing start of four, there are now 74 members of this alliance representing Australians, 25 million consumers and patients, with over 350,000 health professionals, employees and trainees. And it covers all the sectors within health, ranging from government, regulators, we have the full endorsement of all the state health ministers and the federal minister of health, pharmaceutical, medical uh, device industry, hospitals, clinician groups, education sector, most importantly, our patients and patient groups. We thank each and every one of these members who are striving to improve ethics uh, in the sector. I'd now like to hand over to Sophie, who will continue with the rest of this short introduction. Thank you, Sophie. Thanks, Adrian. The Australian Consensus Framework aims are supported by the Australian Ethical Health Alliance's implementation plan. The three key pillars to our implementation plan are our governance strategy, our implementation guide and self-evaluation form, and communication and engagement. Our key outcomes to date uh, see us having developed a terms of reference membership and gov governance documents. Uh, eight member organisations have participated in the implementation and self-evaluation form pilot. We have published academic journal in an, the Journal of uh, Internal Medicine. We've co-hosted Short Stay Arthroplasty, a three-part webinar series, and we've had our first AEHA steering committee election. This framework is not only the basis for how our healthcare sector should function during times of crisis, but also a roadmap for how we can cooperate in the future. The consensus framework has been very important and is very important during times of crisis. And we are in such a, a heightened state of crisis as we are now. We have seen unprecedented cooperation and collaboration across all our stakeholders, across all levels in the Australian healthcare sector. And our, the framework is critical in the crisis recovery efforts. It is also a reminder of this crisis of the importance of ethics, our social solidarity and engagement, building public trust and promoting collective action for the benefit of all. We have seen some extraordinary examples of how consensus framework and cooperation have been brought out during this crisis. We've seen public and private hospitals cooperate to make beds available for COVID-19 patients. We've had government and industry coming together to increase supply of critical medicines and medical equipment. Our consumer and industry groups supported each other and identified and addressing community needs. And our federal and state governments have cooperated and to reduce the national impact of COVID-19. We've had some excellent recognition for our, what, throughout our journey. As I've said, we've had our, the article published in the Journal of Internal Medicine. 
We've contributed to the APEC vision for 2025, where we are encouraging further flexibility and to model the Australian consensus framework, incorporating, the, incorporating those high level principles. We have been received, we've received an invitation to be one of the first signatories to the IFC Ethical Principles in Healthcare, or EPIHC. We love an acronym in our industry by the International Finance Corporation, a part of the World Bank Group. We also have been asked to be involved in a benchmark case study in the International Anti-Corruption Academy in Vienna. We have seen a number of our member organisations, including references to the consensus framework in their documentation that they'll be sharing with their constituents. We've seen the Australian Orthopaedic Association have revised their code of conduct and incorporated the, uh, the statement this year. Um, Medicines Australia, my code that I manage, has been updated uh, and to include the latest statements to the uh, consensus framework. The Medical Technology Association our, have also included it in the revised code of practice, as have the Austra Royal Australasian College of Physicians in their code of conduct in 2019. The future of AHA is bright, and we see that we have a long way to go, but a lot of really great milestones that we wish to achieve. We have our members submitting self-evaluation forms by the end of the year. We'll also be participating in that benchmark case study the launch of our social media strategy and our continuation to increase our profile in 2021. Our member organisations will be monitoring, uh, we have a monitoring process commencing in 2021, a strategy workshop that we're planning for for late next year, when maybe we can all be together face to face. Plus, we will have lots of other activities that we have in the, in the, in the wings, and we also want to continue to grow our AEH membership. I think that's back to you, Adrian. Thanks very much, uh, Sophie. I'd now like to uh, warmly uh, welcome uh, our webinar facilitators, uh, Alison Verhaven, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Healthcare and Hospitals uh, Association, and, uh, and also uh, Wendy uh, Libworth. Um, now over to you, Alison. Thank you very much, Adrian, and good evening all. It gives me great pleasure tonight to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Greg Kesby. Greg is a fellow of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, currently working as a specialist in fetal medicine at Sydney Ultrasound for Women and at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney. Over the last 15 years, Greg's been actively involved in promoting professional standards in med medical practice. He's held significant roles in accreditation and regulation in the medical profession, including as director at the Australian Medical Council, president of the New South Wales Medical Council, chair of the New South Wales Board, uh, Medical Board of Australia, and is a past chair of the Professionalism and Ethics Advisory Committee of RANSCOG. Um, importantly, Greg is currently uh, editing the fifth edition of Good Medical Practice, Professionalism, Ethics and Law for the Australian Medical Council. And this book is a source document for the Medical Board of Australia's Code of Conduct for Medical Practitioners in Australia. We welcome Greg as a recent addition to the steering committee for the Australian Ethical Health Alliance. And I'll now hand over to him for his perspective on ethics in the healthcare sector and its importance during times of crisis. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much, Alison, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I am hoping now to share my screen. And hopefully you can see my title page there. Excellent. <clears throat> so um, I want to sort of, in the time we've got available today, just touch on um, some of the issues that have come to challenge us uh, during this, this crisis. And this crisis, as you know, is, uh, un is unprecedented. Um, when it came to uh, our attention back in March, well, I've started to, to get its legs back in March. We, um, all we knew was that uh, thousands of people were dying, um, many more thousands were sick, um, and that uh, we didn't have any treatment. Um, we were just giving supportive care. The cemeteries were overflowing. People were being piled up in, in back rooms and hospitals. And, and, um, and also we were uh, very poorly prepared had very little in the way of personal protective equipment and um, 
and this was being felt by all of us who were um, expecting or waiting for this uh, this catastrophic atmospheric to sort of arrive on our shore. We were, behind the scenes, we were talking with each other, writing to each other, and getting information by those uh, from those in Europe. And I just want to share a, an email from a colleague in in Italy when I asked him, you know, how are things going, what do we need to prepare for, and he said, "Dear Greg." The situation in Northern Italy is very difficult. The person dies every 15 to 20 minutes. To date, 4,000 people have died. Cemeteries can no longer accept new bodies. Relatives cannot stay close to their loved ones who die and cannot see them after death. Healthcare workers and older people are the most affected. Resuscitation units are full and doctors have to decide who to save. Typically, it will be those who are younger. Ventilators and anesthesiologists are not enough. A hug, Marco. And I think, you know, just getting an email like that when, when it hasn't really hit you on shore, you can, you can sense the tiredness, the anxiety, the exasperation, the sense of catastrophe in his words. And, of course, we had every reason to uh, believe that this was soon to be the situation for us. And when it came, it, it brought with it a, a, a bucket load of fear and a multitude of, of sort of moral challenges um, worthy of sort of ethical reflection. And in the time available, I'm just going to touch briefly on two that personally um, have affected me. And I'd start, like to start by saying that I'm, you know, I don't hold myself out to be an ethicist, but I do see value in critically reflecting or ethically reflecting on, on questions around what, what is the right thing to do when I'm faced with situations that cause me um, moral distress. Generally, when we deliver health care, we, we're going to be focused on delivering patient or person-centred care. And the emphasis is very heavily weighted on, on the ethical principles of respecting an individual's autonomy or their right to self-determination. Um, informed consent is a mainstay of, of, of care. Our, our actions are aimed at benefiting an individual, the patient in front of us, and not causing them any harm. Um, we, we strive, those of us who are professionally motivated, and strive to strive to be true to our professional undertaking to be altruistic, you know, act, act in, the, in the best interest of the patient. Where things first became difficult for me was, was when I started to get a sense of um, disease, I suppose, um, having received a notification from the operating theatre, which basically said quite rightly that um, PPE was limited. Um, but, you know, if you're going to be operating on someone with COVID or suspected of having COVID, that you should operate with or you do need to operate with full um, protective gear. And that was fine. That was, that was, um, that was well-intentioned. But the, the discomfort came when they said they'd done dry runs in the operating theatre and it takes at least 45 minutes for theatres to be prepared for all staff to be in full PPE. Um, so please be aware that your operating uh, times will be delayed by 45 minutes. We appreciate your understanding. And that was problematic for us because although we, we didn't have a lot of patients with diagnosed COVID-19, in fact, diagnosis was taking some time to come through, there was a lot of patients coming through who, who had come from overseas on, uh, from air, by aeroplane who were in hotel quarantine or had sniffles or other mild symptoms that might be flu-like, um, you know, throughout the broader community. And as in the case of obstetrics, when these patients arrived at the hospital, they were managed as suspected COVID-19. Now, we... We knew from our data that less than 5% of those would actually turn out to be COVID-19 positive, but still we had to manage them as if they were um, infected with COVID-19. And at the same time, we had um, information coming through to us. You know, we did have data coming through to us, and this, this is data from March, which basically said that, you know, although people will die from the virus, and we'd heard of all those catastrophic stories, it actually killed a minority of those who were infected. And, and really, it was only of greatest risk to those who were over the age of 60. Um, so younger people, yes, they may get infected. They may have ongoing, they may become sick. They may have ongoing morbidity from the sickness. There was a bit of uncertainty around that. 
but it was very unlikely that they were going to die. Uh, but of course, there was a, a, an atmosphere of uncertainty. The difficulty for us was that the thing we had to get our head around was that you know when we do obstetrics, we have emergencies and we have to move quickly. And 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 in some situations, um, about one in every ten women who comes to labour ward, they will need a, an emergency cesarean section, which is a cesarean section in labour. But in, in many of those, or, in, or at least in a sizable proportion of those, it's going to be one of those every minute counts scenarios where babies are being starved of oxygen and every minute counts, every minute that passes, the baby is prone to being brain damaged. And, and if, if it goes on for too long, um, it'll actually result in fetal death. And because of this, in accepting the communique that it takes 45 minutes for someone suspected of COVID who's got less than 5% chance of, of having COVID being operated on by a young on-call team who are at a low risk of getting sick or, or, or dying from the disease, it, it created a fair bit of um, moral angst about what was the right thing to do. I mean, you couldn't just be a cowboy and rush into theatre and, and section a patient who needed delivery, but it did mean that everything was turned upside down. We, instead of accepting that vaginal birth was the norm and we should get consent for cesarean section when it, the need arose, in women with COVID-19 or suspected COVID-19, we actually needed to get consent for vaginal birth, given the inherent risks that were associated with, that, that might arise um, in the course of a labour and, and require emergency delivery. And in that situation, given that information, um, most opted for elective caesarean section. The real difficulty came in thinking through, and thankfully I wasn't challenged with it, the scenario of the woman who came through the door, suspected of COVID-19, but already in a situation of crisis. One, one where you couldn't have that, that formal discussion around getting informed consent. And this is a situation where there really was a tension arising between, um, or the dilemma that arose around how do you balance the risk of harm to a patient's physical or mental health with that of a healthcare worker's physical and mental health in, in the setting of pandemic? As there's clearly a tension between the two. And this is where ethical reflection, ethical analysis sort of is helpful because you can't get away from the, from the moral distress of having to place a fetus and a mother at risk when you're an obstetrician who spent 25 years trying to do the opposite. But it is important to reflect and to think that in, in addition to sort of affording a patient a degree of protection in the delivery of healthcare, staff also require a degree of protection because they're also human beings and like everyone else who, you know, whose well-being matters. And like everybody else, they have their own anxieties around their welfare, their own social circumstances, they may have their own underlying illnesses. They, they may be caring for elderly patients, parents at home and, and be at risk of infecting parents if they didn't protect themselves at work. And it also needs to be recognised that, you know, healthcare workers, particularly in the early days where PPE was fairly limited, they were, they were coming to work and putting themselves forward to care for patients. And it's, and it's crucial that healthcare workers are willing to do that, given that they were now in a situation there was, where there was a, a heightened burden of risk and that we didn't render them physically or mentally incapable of, of actually do it, coming and doing their job. You know, we need them to turn up to work. And this, this touched on the, on the concept of ethics, uh, in ethics of reciprocity. And, and you'll remember a bunch of doctors wrote to the healthcare minister and said, well, if we're gonna put ourselves out this way for you, you have to give an undertaking to us. You have to reciprocate and say that you will prioritize the, the um, the protection of staff in healthcare settings, which um, thankfully the Minister for Health uh, stood up and, and gave that pledge. And it is, it is appropriate that reciprocity is acting here. It is right for an institution to acknowledge that this burden of risk to healthcare workers and reciprocate by, by striving to, to provide them a safe work environment. And of course, there is always uh, the um, occupational health and safety requirement under law for an employer um, to work in this way. That's one example of where ethics in healthcare was important in the setting of crisis. 
The other one um, relates to the situation I faced in my own practice where we had staff test positive for COVID-19 and in the fullness of time, we spread infection to about a dozen other people, uh, family of staff and patients, uh, patients themselves. We were the so-called unnamed private health facility in Liverpool, um, where we provided sort of healthcare to women who were pregnant or who were going through gynecological problems. And besides all the anxiety and disruption infection in the practice cause having to shut down the practice, um, we also had New South Wales Public Health on our backs to contact trace and isolate anyone who might have come in contact with our infected persons. And, and this, this is where, again, my sort of moral compass was unsettled when a request came through for us to start to, in a sense, breach privacy and, and provide information to public health officials um, around who had attended our practice. Just a brief look through day one, of the three days of information they wanted, there was an elderly woman with gynecological cancer who didn't want to tell the family before Christmas. Um, we had a 16 year old who came to see how far advanced her pregnancy was because she was going to go on and have a termination of pregnancy without family and friends knowing. And of course, there were going to be other people with their own sensitivities around this. And I was quickly pointed by public health when I asked the question, you know, can, can, is there a legal basis for me doing this? They pointed to the health uh, privacy law and I said, yes, there is. If it's impractical to get consent of people and, and you think it's necessary to move quickly to pre prevent a serious threat to life or the safety of any individual or to public health and safety, then you are permitted by law to release this information. And I suppose there was a comfort in knowing that I had a clause to give me an out in this situation and just sort of push this across to public health. Um, but it's not necessarily the case that as long as something is, act, you know, as long as one's acting lawfully, that you're actually acting ethically. And so it, it was reasonable to take a little bit of time to reflect on this and, and, um, and reference thinking to, to, to others, which I did. And in the fullness of time, I did choose to release the information. Why did I do this? Well, my rationale was largely based on the concept of the greater good, quite frankly, in, in a crisis setting. The information was needed for a significant public health purpose. There was a community mandate for authorities to sort of limit the spread of the virus. There was a need for the patients to be contacted, informed about the exposure. And that could be done by our staff um, uh, or by public health. Clearly the machinery of public health was a much larger and, and more nimble machine. And all of this sort of favored release of information, even though I still had personal awkwardnesses around um, the, you know, what may flow from, from um, people getting cold calls from public health, because these people obviously then have to go into their 14 days of self-isolation, explain that to family and friends, et cetera. And it's only then when I sort of made that rational dissection that I could actually draw some comfort from the fact that I was actually legally um, permitted, uh, permitted to do so. So what, what's going on here in a situation of crisis? Well, well, to understand that we need to go back to the basics of the ethical principles, the ethical principle of autonomy, the right to self-determination, non-maleficence, which is not producing harm, beneficence, which is doing good, and, and justice or fairness, which, which underpin all of our decision-making in healthcare. Although the challenges we face in the delivery of healthcare in the situation of crisis, such as a pandemic, um, do give rise to challenging questions, which do produce tension with our own set of moral values, the ethical principles that we apply to decision-making is still based on, on these four. They, they don't change. What changes is that some of these principles are brought more to the fore and others are pushed a little bit more, you know, back into the background. I mean, generally in healthcare, we focus, as we've talked about, on individualising autonomy and, and, and benefit. But in a situation of crisis, uh, we're forced to, to push individual autonomy a little bit back in, or more into the background and consider our decisions more heavily based on principles of benefit and non-harm and justice or fairness at a more of a, a community or public health level. 
it, it's, it's basically that we're moving towards elevating societal or public health considerations in our delivery of healthcare in meeting a public interest in being fair to all concerned in the setting of an overwhelming uh, community threat. And although that's not completely satisfying, it is ethically uh, sound. Give it, and as long as we give voice to the transparency about what we're doing here, we're really adopting a form of util, uh, utilitarianism, a prioritized type of utilitarianism. Is, is, and it's probably the most comfortable ethical resting place that we can we can we can sit at when grappling with the moral discomforts we feel in working through some of the ethical decisions we face. So I think I'll leave it there and 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 take up the discussion a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. And well, I'll now pass over to my co-facilitator, Wendy Lipworth, who's going to introduce our second speaker. Um, thanks, Alison. Um, so it gives me great pleasure now to introduce Professor Erwin Lowe, um, who is National Chief Medical Officer and Group General Manager Cl Clinical Governance for St Vincent's Health Australia, which is the nation's largest not-for-profit health and aged care provider. Um, he's also worked as a full-time lawyer and is a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Victoria and High Court of Australia. He also holds a number of academic appointments, including um, being a professor in the Department of Medical Education at the University of Melbourne, an adjunct, cl adjunct clinical professor at Monash, and an honorary professor at Macquarie University at the Centre for Health Systems and Safety Research. Um, so I'll hand over to Erwin now to give a more organisation level perspective on the ethical dilemmas that we've faced. Thank you, Wendy. That's fantastic. And um, thank you, Greg. So Greg's basically set the scene um, in, from an individual clinician perspective. And we know that that's where the pointy end of ethics uh, plays out. But there is a role for organisations as well to have infrastructure and governance frameworks in place to ensure that there is an ethical culture. So my talks really are uh, a high, at a higher level to look at the system and to look at our organization. So I teach um, ethical decision-making for Monash University's master's program and for my um, college as well. So this is an area of interest of mine. And Greg's beautifully laid out the tension between our individual morals, our beliefs that is um, part of our upbringing, our religious backgrounds and our own values, the ethics that bind society. And then on top of that, the law, which is the officially endorsed behavior. And there is an interplay, but they're all slightly different. And um, Greg, again, beautifully kind of explain how something that might, might be legal might not actually be ethical. So <clears throat> for example, something that's clearly illegal and unethical in an organization is corruption. But then there are cases where someone might potentially be breaching confidentiality to whistleblow, ethical, but potentially illegal. And then you've got um, a lot of some organizations which might be polluting legally, but demonstrating unethical behavior. And obviously where we want to be is be both ethical and legal. So how do we, how do, we do that? How do we get to that point? So just a bit about St. Vincent's Health Australia. Um, we were founded by Mother Mary Aikenhead. She's, she founded the Sisters of Charity in 1815 in Ireland. In 1838, five Sisters of Charity nuns came to Australia, primarily to look after the convicts that were coming from the, from the UK. And in 1857, they founded our first hospital, St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. And the rest is history. But what they gave us as an organization is basically their values of compassion, justice, integrity, and excellence. And the mission, which is really to be committed to bringing God's love to those in need, but especially to those who are poor and vulnerable. And really that, that mission is embedded into everything that we do at St. Vincent's and guides our ethical behavior. So today, this is 
basically the national stats for COVID-19 as of today. Nobody in ICU, in fact, in most states, nobody in hospitals. Victoria discharged our last patient in the hospital yesterday. And um, we're doing well, but if you go back three months, so that's today, and then three months ago, this, this was the situation, 52 people in ICU, 682 people in hospital. Um, you know, we were right in the middle of the second wave of COVID-19, in particular in Victoria. So if you look here in terms of the number of people who had to be hospitalized at the peak, you can see we were reaching almost 700 around the August mark, um, the majority in Victoria. And then in terms of people in ICU, and the clinicians on the line would know, uh, we were being pushed to the limit, um, over 50 people uh, overseas. Nothing compared, obviously, to overseas countries, but you know we were concerned. So from my point of view, there's six areas of ethical um, considerations that we need to look at during a pandemic for organizations, which then filters down to individuals. So number one, prioritization. Number two, how we manage PP. Number three, staff, health, and well-being. And by the way, all of these issues are overlap. They overlap and they are related. Number four, the supply chain, how we manage that. Vaccines, which is all related to what I've just said. Research in COVID-19. And last but not least, how we manage end of life. Um, so the first thing here is um, prioritization. So we know um, during the best of times, but especially during a pandemic, you need to have criteria in terms of who gets admitted into ICU, for example. So ICU is an extreme example of access to limited resources, but you know, this applies to most other things. So with ICU, for example, intensivists will, will have criteria, SOFA scores or whatever we want to call them, there are plenty of research studies around what you use, but most of them are based on clinical prognostic factors. So you get into ICU if we think that it's going to be clinically relevant, it's not going to be futile, and it's going to help. And um, I think if you were this person who's young, healthy, come from a Caucasian background, you, and, uh, and then you get COVID-19 and you get quite sick, you'll be prioritized. If you're elderly though, and, and this is what's happened in some jurisdictions overseas when um, there are a finite number of ICU beds and the on an ICU is full, you get to a point where then you have to make hard decisions. Do you start to say, actually, if I'm faced between a young person and an elderly person, I'm gonna admit the young person. Uh, and and that's, that's actually happened. In fact, I've heard the term negative triaging used for that. And what happens then, if you're actually from a disadvantaged group, from a uh, minority group, from an ethnic uh, background person who might have uh, more chronic disease, diabetes, for example, uh, someone from an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander background, what happens if they have to compete for an ICU bed? So Australia as a nation did not have to really grapple with this issue because we never actually got overrun because of good public health management. Having said that, I think now is the time to kind of look ourselves in the, in, in, in the mirror to ask, what will we do? How will we kind of deal with this? It's not going to be simple because uh, this is something that St. Vincent's Health Australia has looked at. And I'm glad that Greg actually talked about the multiple tensions between the different ethical principles. And from our point of view, um, Dan Fleming was actually on the line. I saw his name there. And I, we worked on a, um, a set of principles for St. Vincent's, which we, we've published in mean, MJ Insight. But what we talked about was um, that during good times, we want to have justice for all. But then when crisis comes, um, and, and Greg points out, you know, sometimes there is that pressure to modify the way we deal with ethics. But our argument would be that as best as we can, we need to be consistent and we need to be fair and we need to be just. And so um, one of the things that people have written about um, around the world, really, this is in the BMJ, but also in the New England Journal in the UK and the US, is structural racism, um, how there's systematic bias against certain um, populations in our society that during the best of times, you know, they, they are suffering uh, reduced care, but during a, during a pandemic, during a crisis, they might be even more disadvantaged. So there's all this discussion around, you know, do we actually prioritize racial minorities for vaccines, for other treatments? It's a question, you know, it's an ethical question. Um, the other thing that I had on my list was PPE. So um, we understand that there are different levels of PPE. You have your surgical masks and face masks, 
And, but then you have your N95 or P2 respirators for um, aerosol generating type procedures. And we know that um, in medicine, that's been a huge area of debate. We know initially when the pandemic occurred, research was still cutting edge and we were learning more and more. And we've now since realized that um, COVID-19 now potentially has a lot more airborne transmission uh, potentiality uh, rather than just contact. And so um, that prompted the federal government and the different states to come up with different PP guidelines. And uh, that also led to a whole lot of discussion around fit testing, um, you know, because um, you not, not much point giving someone a special respirator if it doesn't fit properly and it leaks. But this is all this debate and discussion and, and, and tension comes about because of the fact that initially, and Greg alluded to this, there was a shortage of PPE around the world. And um, this, this led to lots of discussion uh, by different jurisdictions. And there was a lot of people who believe that a lot of the guidelines around PPE was less to protect staff and more to conserve PPE. And to be fair, there is some truth in that. Um, there is, um, because um, at the early stages of the pandemic, we weren't facing the numbers of transmission in the community that other, other countries were. So we were treating it very differently, but there was a lot of tension and a lot of what I would call ethical discussion around, is it ethical to prioritize um, sustaining a supply of PPE versus um, healthcare worker protection? And, um, and this is the um, kind of outcome really in, in Victoria, when we were going through the second wave, what Victoria was seeing over time was an increasing number of healthcare workers becoming infected with COVID-19 with primar primarily workplace related, right? And so if you look at Victoria, if you look at in August in the peak of the second wave, 15,000 cases and overall uh, almost 2000 were in healthcare workers. And um, in fact, this was actually something that we had to struggle with at St. Vincent's, right? So this is a paper uh, and a newspaper article that came out in October. And in, they listed out all the hospitals with the most healthcare cases. As you can see on the list, St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne was number two next to Royal Melbourne. And um, this was something that hit us hard. We initially were um, following the state guidelines and making sure that we were protecting patients, but it came to, we came to realize that actually we were neglecting ensuring that our staff were safe. So we started to basically increase our PP guidelines above the states. And we dictated that um, we wanted our staff to start using N95 masks. And, and now we are obviously implementing um, a respiratory protection program, fit testing across our hospitals. But it's, it's a real issue. There's the ethical contention there. And this is kind of like, this is a list of the things that we did uh, at St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, where we actually went to a level four PPE before the state actually said that to go there a week later. Uh, we actually went there first um, to protect our staff. And you can see then the cases coming down when we did that. Um, and, and this leads me to talk about um, the supply chain and, and, and so the toilet paper issue, right? So I think people are aware of what I'm talking about. When there is a crisis, certain things become uh, hard to get. Toilet paper is, is one thing, but it is really a reflection of, of everything else. So the principle with toilet paper supplies to masks, to gowns, to gloves, is when there is a crisis, people um, get concerned, they buy more than they need, and that leads to other people who haven't initially had no concerns buying more as well. And that what happens is then it jacks up the price. And so we know that around the world, PPE equipment has increased in price, and sometimes 1,000%. And, um, and what became quite um, perverse is that states were bidding against each other, and this, is, this was happening at the start of the pandemic, uh, they were bidding against the Commonwealth government. In fact, hospitals were bidding against hospitals. I know at St. Vincent's Health Australia, we were so concerned we had to, we wanted our own stockpile and it, it was it created this artificial um, uh, lack of supply. Really, uh, really an issue. Now, the other thing that um, kind of then played out is human rights. So the, because we people wanted to create more, more and more PPE, um, there was concern that PPE was unethically sourced and we actually faced it at St. Vincent's Health. We, that issue from about rubber gloves from Malaysia, actually we had to struggle with because we, we had cheap, we ordered cheap gloves from the, that particular supplier. When we did our own um, modern slavery investigation into the supplier, we found out that actually um, 
there were concerns. And so we canceled the order and bought from, a, from another supplier at a high price. But again, there was an ethical issue there. I'm gonna to touch on vaccines because vaccines kind of related to this. So we know about vaccines. This is one uh, illness that has one of the most number of vaccines, 155 in preclinical testing and 11 in phase three. And we know the four front run runners, Modena, Pfizer, they're both mRNA vaccines. You've got Sputnik and then you've got um, uh, Oxford, which are both adenovirus vaccines. Um, and I won't go into detail about any of them, but I think um, first thing to say is that rich countries now have bought up most of the vaccines. So that's an ethical issue for the world. Um, and the other thing to say then is that certain vaccines also do have ethical questions. So the Oxford vaccine used a, a cell line, stem cell line that was derived from aborted fetuses in 1970 and some religious le leaders have raised it as a concern. So um, that's one ethical issue with vaccines. But then the other kind of big thing is the fact that um, who gets it first, right? So at the moment we're prioritizing healthcare workers and the elderly, but is that right? And the last point about vaccines is that they're being created, they're being developed at, at pandemic speed. And really, um, they are now talking about challenging healthy people with, with this. And um, what would normally take four to 12 years is taking us one year, right? One of 18 months. It's much compressed. Now, that's not to say it's not safe, but obviously there are kind of ethical questions around the speed that we're doing this. Um, but, you know, we kind of need to. And then kind of little, um, I want to make the point uh, is that at the same time, research in COVID-19 uh, is, is it's accelerating. It's the most studied virus. And, um, but there's the question about the waste and the speed of doing the research. There's lots of low quality now. Um, there is a huge challenge for us, in particular the number of preprints pre that are publicized. We know that um, the number of journal articles going up, preprints are going up, but then Peer reviewed journals, in fact, are accelerating COVID-19 articles. And that, there's a question, I mean, they're saying that they want the, the research out there, but there's a question around quality. So that's another ethical issue. Last point I'll make before I kind of wrap up is that uh, it's triggering a lot of end of life discussions and planning because of the number of deaths in particular in the US. But the, the fact that we've had to shut down our hospitals uh, during the middle of the pandemic created a lot of problems at St. Vincent's Health we, we pride ourselves on giving people good deaths and making this a priority for us. So we've had to apply to ministers to allow for family to meet uh, COVID-19 infected um, family members who are dying. So we kind of have to deal with that, but that's a real issue, but it's something that uh, some instance we focus on. So look, I'm gonna end with this, right? So we all know what's going on with the SAS and the war crime issue and the, and, and the ethical issues with that, right? Everyone knows about it. But my point here is this, um, the, the, the Australian Defence Force holds itself up to a very high standard in terms of the behaviour. In fact, it's looked upon by everybody around the world as having, you know, being the gold standard. But, and yet we've had this issue. And this issue with soldiers acting unethically comes out of um, a, an, a, a, an environment of crisis, an environment where they had to make decisions quickly, under lots of stress, under danger and risk. And my, my point is this, uh, crisis reduces our true character and it often teaches us more about ourselves than we might learn in times of peace. So this pandemic has, I think, revealed to us our true character as a nation, true characters as healthcare organizations and as clinicians. I think you know, we need to really continue to see how we act during this crisis and then remember how we were during peacetime and Hopefully we don't make concessions and change. I'm gonna stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Erwin. That was really terrific. And thanks also to our previous speaker, Greg, and to Wendy, who introduced Erwin. Um, it's time um, now for us to have a discussion. And if you, I see some questions have already been posted up in the Q&A section, um, and there have been a couple posted up in the chat section as well. So if you've got some questions, um, put them up there. Um, I'm going to um, start with a question which is actually to both of you, um, Erwin and Greg. And so feel free either of you to pipe in and answer. Um, and this is a question from uh, Ian Kerridge. 
Infectious diseases are renowned for exposing strengths and weaknesses that already exist. Uh, Ian notes that in the US, it seems clear that COVID-19 exposed fractures on race and socioeconomic determinants in access to healthcare. And this is something you raised, um, Erwin, during your presentation. In Australia, COVID has probably exposed the strength of our health system, of our public health system and our hospital system. But what do you feel are the weaknesses or existing fracture lines that is exposed in Australia? Um, and Ian's provided a few examples, um, the casualisation of the workforce, aged care, for example. But um, Erwin, perhaps I'll start with you, Erwin, and then go to Greg. Oh. Where, where do you think the weaknesses might be? I think um, Ian's very um, observant, and, and I think he's hit the on the head on some of those topics. I think aged care is clearly a deficiency in our nation that the pandemic has exposed. In fact, we didn't need the pandemic to expose it. We were doing a Royal Commission into it. And then the pandemic hit. And the reality is that despite the fact that we had a Royal Commission and we had a lot of learnings, we actually were slow and almost negligent, to be honest, to apply those learnings during the pandemic. And that's actually, as for St. Vincent's, one of our, our learnings, we, were ex we bought up uh, and got donations of many ventilators. We doubled our ICU beds. We were prepared for an ICU search because of the learnings from Italy, but that never happened. What happened to us was the fact that aged care facilities started to get infections. They started to have to shut down and we had to turn two of our private hospitals completely into aged care facilities. Um, we thank God that none of our, we have 20 aged care facilities at St. Vincent's, none of them got any infections. And that's um, by the grace of God and by the fact that we had strong legal governance processes. But I think, um, the quality of our entire aged care system was a weakness that clearly was further exposed by the pandemic. I think the, um, the thing that was, uh, that was pointed in the comments is around the failure of federalism. I think less that and more the tension between um, Commonwealth and state, the fact that we don't have a uh, federal CDC or federal kind of system of public health. It's all state-based. And that again was exposed uh, when Victoria had the second wave and the fact that Victoria had a different way of hotel quarantining, different public health system that what might not be as robust as the other states. And that, again, I think that was exposed. It's, um, you know, I'll stop there. That, thanks, Erwin. And Greg, any reflections from you on the weaknesses in the system and, and that impact on ethics? Yeah, I, um, I mean, I'd agree with uh, all that was just said. It, it, the other concern I've had is the... Um, the, the sort of the unintended consequences of, of well-meaning actions, um, the deny the the effect it's had on just uh, care of people with other chronic illnesses, or even uh, those who are um, who have uh, felt a limited access to health care with more acute uh, illnesses. I think I'd make the comment that you know it's it's always it's it's clearly preferable for a, um, an ethical framework to be stood up in a considered and methodological uh, manner, you know, a sound manner rather than tr sort of doing it on the run. And um, not that I'd turn my mind to epidemics and pandemics much prior to COVID, but, you know, we have, there has been a world experience with other um, very serious infective diseases. And, and I, and I think that, you know, bioethicists, I think for quite a while have, um, you know, Trump been pushing this idea that, you know, collective forethought and having a broad consensus um, would help a, a great deal when, when you start to tackle unique moral and ethical dilemmas that arise in catastrophic events. And I was just personally a bit disappointed as an observer about the lack of preparedness and the lack of... Um, well, at least my um, the lack of meaningful discussion is in this arena, even though we have had SARS and Ebola and, and many other sort of examples. Um, I think I'll just leave it there. Thanks, thanks very much, um, Greg. And I note that um, one of the commentators on the chat forum has uh, mentioned. Um, a national health charter and human rights convention as being possibly a way to provide some of that framework. But 
clearly we've also tried to do that with the Australian Consensus Framework as well. Um, Wendy, can I pass over to you now in case you've got any questions you'd like to put to our panellists? Um, sure. So well, there have been a few other questions that have come through. I guess one that maybe pulls together a few threads. Um, this is for you, Erwin. I was just wondering, given that you work for an organisation that has a very clear mission, um, you know, that, that's quite, you know, in some ways unique. I was wondering if you experienced any tensions or conflicts between your hospital's mission, your personal, well, you, you're not a clinician, but maybe the ethics of the clinicians that, that were, were working in your health system and the broader health system demands. I mean, you sort of talked about it in a way that suggested that maybe they all kind of aligned, but were there any situations in which they didn't? And how did you deal with that? Sure. I mean, the first thing to, to say um, is that although I'm not a frontline clinician, I do see myself as a clinician and I, I, and I do have a duty of care to yeah. the patients and the community. Um, I think uh, there is less tension than you, ex than, than you would think, because um, I think uh, denominational faith-based organizations and non-faith-based organizations, they all have a mission, which is to look after the community. Um, and I think even the for-profit um, private um, health networks do have a mission to look after people as well. So I think if you look at the people who work in those organizations, they do help hold themselves up to a high ethical regard. I think when it comes to pointy uh, kind of things, a great example is the uh, voluntary assisted dying uh, framework in Victoria. Um, uh, denominational um, hospitals have said that they're not going to provide that. But having said that, we would support our patients to make the decision. We will ensure we uh, uh, empower them to uh, go somewhere else if they need to, and we will organize uh, all that they need to, to accommodate that. So that's, that's an example. Um, but in general, I think um, we are much more aligned than we are different. And in fact, in, in almost all senses, we are working together. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Alison, so, you... oh, sorry. No, nothing. I was just looking at the question. Okay, yeah, there are quite a few here. Alison, did you want to choose another question? Sure, Wendy. Um, the, a comment has come through about the social determinants and their impact on access to appropriate care during COVID-19. Um, and I wonder, um, I, I know, Erwin, you will have certainly experienced that at St Vincent's in Melbourne. Greg, I wonder if you've got any observations as well on that. Um, I, I personally haven't been challenged with considerations around that, but I have I have mused um, a little in the area of, uh, of, of paediatrics. You know, we were talking before about um, prioritising care and certainly colleagues overseas in the early days were just, I was saying, you know, what do you, what do, you do with uh, your patients? And they said, well, you know, we've only got 30 beds. Um, he said, so anyone who comes to accident emergency with a cough who's over the age of 60, we just don't even see them. You know, the team, the team that triages two high dependency beds don't even go to the bedside of those patients. They're just excluded from consideration in terms of thinking about quality of life and, and, um, and how many uh, life years that you might salvage from, from a treatment. And in the children, in the paediatric population, it starts to get very uncomfortable because it's... Um, Clearly, children can live for many years, but but there are children who have got uh, fairly complex medical um, settings, um, you know, comorbidities, etc. It's not it's not just a function of age; it's really a function of of what other health issues are playing into the into the mix. Um, you know, is is the is a child with uh, a level of cognitive impairment who may live to ripe old ages? Is that is that a life less important than a, than a child who doesn't have cognitive impairment? And, and this is where, you know, intrinsically, I think we, we know morally about what is the so-called correct answer here, but this is where I come back to, you know, these sorts of discussions need to occur in a rational way away from, um, away from pandemic scenarios. But, but I'd, be, uh, I'd be interested to, um, to hear Erwin's uh, view on this. 
Owen, over to you. Thank you, Greg. Sure. I mean, I know that there's only half a minute left uh, for the webinar, <laughs> and it's a big topic, right? <laughs> I think um, the first thing to say is that um, uh, quality, you know, quality is just a lot of years. It's, um, it's, a, it's a convenient way of trying to come up with some mathematical formula to decide if someone's uh, worthy to, to get access to, to healthcare. But th it's been debated quite a lot, both in the journals and also in the media. And in fact, there was a recent article around this and economists would argue that you don't, you don't apply, it's quality is not something that you do for prioritization. It's, it's actually been developed for something else. Um, but anyway, that's it's it's uh, we would argue that's something that we that that can be considered, but shouldn't be the primary way of looking at things because you know uh, someone who's elderly, someone who's young. I don't think that you can argue that one life's more worthy than the other. It has something else. It has to be about something something clinical, something prognostic, not just quality. If you know what I mean. So I, I don't know that we should even look into it. I think um, your point about. Um, uh, Making a, making, a, making a decision now during peacetime was the point I was trying to make at the end of my talk is that during crisis, the equivalent is during a wartime, um, it's easy to uh, make compromises. It's easy to say, to, to argue, this is, this is wartime, we have to make hard decisions. You know, I, I, I think that's um, uh, selling ourselves short as, as a people. And I think we need to, as you say, during peacetime, let's just pick up our minds. This is what we're going to do. And we're going to be just, and we're going to be uh, fair, and we're going to treat everyone equally, and then we'll move forward. Um, anyway, I'll stop there, because I think we've run out of time. Thank you very much, Ewan. and that's a great point to finish on. I'm going to hand over to Adrian Casenza just to close our session off this evening. Well, thank you very much. Can I please um, pass on behalf of the group and those listening, thanks to our special guest speakers, Erwin and Greg, provided really stimulating thoughts uh, and some good discussion and, and sincere thanks to Alison, Wendy and Sophie. Uh, and very special thanks to Talissa uh, Trevelyan, who uh, is a pillar of strength behind the scenes for the Australian Ethical Health Alliance. And we thank each of you who've taken the time to listen. Uh, this uh, webinar was recorded uh, and uh, it will be shared with you uh, as members uh, and the questions that have been posted, we will we'll do our very best to come back and provide responses. So on that note, thank you very much and please look out for the next webinar early in the new year. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.